interested in these open source tools as a way to jump over a bunch of the hurdles in getting getting students computing. So I was helping to facilitate this program that we called modules. The idea is like trying to get all students in all parts of UC Berkeley to touch data science and not have it just be the domain of you know, something called data science, but data science isn't everywhere. Part of the big mission is just inclusion in STEM, make, trying to make STEM more inclusive, trying to get more people into a bigger tent. Um, but as you can see, they're all over the place. There's like English, rhetoric, neuroscience, ethnic studies, like lots of different fields that we've made these modules for. So what I want to talk about today a little bit is like, there's some of it that's just writing curriculum that's open source, but some of it that's like a whole suite of tools that's about delivering it to the student with this low barrier to like engagement or activation, right? So part of it's an infrastructure thing that's open source, cloud-based. There's a computing resource that's in just in a browser tab. The freshman at UC Berkeley doesn't know anything about all this sort of like open source material that's behind it. They just know that their lesson on day one can open in a browser tab and they can start going. And that's part of what's making it easier. There's no like install an IDE, get a software license. There's none of that day one problem. Now as a teacher or for me, I work with the big university with the graduate students, tons of that falls on them. So there's also this thing of like trying to reduce the burden for the person teaching that compute class so that they'll be more likely to take on something more interesting, right? If they are like, oh, I have to get a cipher, I have to get a thousand kids a software license, I just won't bother. Um, so we have these modules, um, you know, as we build them over time, it has become its own open educational resource. Like there's a library of all different subjects. So if I have a new person, I can be like, oh, here's how they did it in a history class. Here's how they did it in a French class. And I can show people illustrations. One of the most important things I do is like show people what somebody else did so they can imagine what they're gonna do uh, for the next class. Um, so a little bit of background on what's happening at Berkeley just to frame this though. So data science started in 2015. There's now this huge intro class, data eight. And there's 3000 students a year that take that big intro class. And the infrastructure that I'm gonna talk about was built for that big intro class. Uh, what's awesome is it gets people from all sorts of majors in that class. There's 35 different majors, sometimes more in any given, uh, you know, iteration of the class. And then we built a set of connector courses. So there's a whole set of courses that are built like you take data eight, but you also learn neuroscience. You also learn uh, earthquakes at the same time. And so it's like they're bridges out to other fields of the university. And then the thing that I was talking about here is like with this infrastructure, we're also able to put things into other classes with these data modules, like a social justice class or, or a, you know, an economics class. You can just put this little active compute into other classes because this Jupyter infrastructure is there. So we also have like involvement of a lot of student teams. We have about a hundred students across 10 different student teams. And I have one student team that's just building open source curriculum in Jupiter. So the students go through a few data science classes, they get recruited to a team, then they're building the curriculum for other students in other classes. And that gathers over time. So like, that's how you build a library over semesters. So the big thing is like this delivery of an infrastructure, right? So they can teach these huge classes that have 1400 people in a class because there's this really amazing elastic scalable open source software. There's a Jupyter Hub for everyone at UC Berkeley. You just log on with your same credentials. So they've been able to build these. These are the core classes of our major, Data 8 to Data 100. Data 102 is machine learning. Um, and then you know, that class will be like projects, homework assignments, all done in Jupyter Notebooks. So the bulk of what you do for each class for these big data classes is a lot of work in these narrative Jupyter Notebooks that are like lesson one, we'll take you through this, we'll explore this, learn little bits of code like a Lego that builds up to something over time. Um, so after that, as I said, we have this like infrastructure built for these main classes. And then we can put these other classes like the connector classes or the modules 
or other people's classes that want to use Jupyter onto that same infrastructure that's already built. Um, so as I said, the students don't necessarily see this in other classes. They don't know about, you know, they're taking their, all their materials are sourced from GitHub. All their materials are on Google Cloud with Kubernetes. Students in the class never know that. They never see anything about Google Cloud. They never see anything about GitHub. They just see the materials. Um, but there's like this stack of open source stuff behind it. One thing that I do get involved with sometimes is like when we're trying to reach out to new communities. So Julia is another language. Should there be a Julia hub for the people teaching in Julia? There's an R hub. There's so many people teaching in R that there's, you know, to have a first best R hub. Right now we're building out in biology. So genetics is a lot of specific tools for like alignment of genomes. So there's a biology hub. Uh, there was one that was going to work for circuit board. So at what point do you use one infrastructure for all your classes or do you build like a specific hub where you can create a new community around some infrastructure? Um, one thing that's hard to also describe culturally is like I learn about open source from the infrastructure people that I work with who basically run the campus infrastructure as an open source project. And everything's there, like the way they build it, the way they deploy it is all run as an open source project. Like if I wanna communicate with them, it's like open a GitHub issue about our project, right? So there's also just some cultural things about the infrastructure people that they're running their operation as an open source project as well. And the, where this comes up is, you know, the next person that wants to join the project in UC Berkeley or somebody outside UC Berkeley that wants to see what we're doing, like it's all documented, all the underwear is hanging on the line there and you can go and sort of like see the travails of what, what it takes to get it all running. Here's a funny graphic of just like, what's it like on a given day, hundreds of users, right? So this is a thousand users at the top. So we're like somewhere over 600 users on any given day on a set of different uh, servers. Um, what's great about this is you see when the students actually stop working at four in the morning. Um, college students have their own hours. Um, just a couple more things here. Like, so this is uh, also for auto grading. So if you're running a class with 1500 students, you need the robot to take some of the work on. So. We also, I have a small group of students that work on the open source project for the auto grading. Uh, this is a fertile area of innovation that the commercial vendors aren't really even up on. Um, so this is, uh, you know, potentially open source is leading the way here. They we're also building it out for R grading. There's not such great auto grading for R yet. So we're taking the tool that we have for Python grading and making it work for R grading. This is sort of an active project in development. It's a little bit harder for that professor that doesn't know computer science to take on. And so there's a hard thing where like the open source software as it works, works for a subset of the population that's like a CS professor or somebody who has a very smart CS undergrad, you know, uh, course staff, but doesn't necessarily work for, uh, you know, the history professor is not gonna be able to take this on. Um, and that's a whole, whole development question. Um, another thing that we do is a lot of our things run on Jupyter Books. So all those big classes, I told you Data 8, Data 100, Data 102, they write a set of Jupyter Notebooks for their course material. And then there's a way that you can create an online textbook through that. All of our documentation is run for, through that. I have a side class on economics, it's run through this. So these are all textbooks that are creating by professors. You can update them live during the semester. You can link out. So what you do in your open source textbook looks a lot like what the homework and labs are because it's the same material. So it's really rich. I do a lot about exporting the data eight to other universities in the country. And because it's an open textbook is that's why we're getting so many people to adopt it. And so people can just, you know, have a textbook that references the concepts in the labs and homeworks. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. And the fact that somebody went down this pathway of making open educational resources years ago is making like the ramifications more each day. 
One whole last thing I'll talk about is there are some open uh, Python packages for each class. So if you're trying to teach data science, where do you start? Um, and so they've made, uh, you know, a data eight course package, but these are published as open Python packages. Anyone in the world can use them, you know, at the stroke of, you know, pip install. So these are sort of on-ramp scaffolded, well thought out, what's the right sort of training wheels to give a freshman in college to learn data science tools. Um, so, what I'm trying to say is there like, there's a whole bunch of different open source components that are sort of coming together to make this package. There's no one single element, but it's making it possible to sort of spread things, uh, you know, broadly, get people to encourage adoption, get more and more and more faculty involved. Um, that's my little spiel. <laughs> I shouldn't talk too much. Um, Did, were you in the, the coffee thing this morning, Eric? I was not. What were they? Oh, I was so on yesterday. Am, so there was, there was some discussion around OERs this morning, and I dropped some stuff in about okay. A, UNESCO's push for OERs, and B, OERU. Do you know about them at all? This is this is out of New Zealand, and it's it's trying to be kind of like the OER version of edX. Nice. Run by a bunch of guys out of New Zealand with um, videos. I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't dived into the course materials yet, but um, they're definitely folks you probably want to talk to. Very cool. Yeah, we know the people at Davis Libre Text. They're like a big movement in this area. That's like the free textbook movement yeah this is this is courseware and coursework and they've they've figured out a way with the problems with credit hours being different in different countries how to make like a one unit course where the one unit is is equal to everybody else you know and and so anybody can use it and they can scale them up and build them up it's it's interesting stuff it's early um okay but you you might enjoy talking to them. Very cool. And then the other piece that I, I learned wearing my brand new shiny open at RIT hat was that any college that has a Barnes and Noble <laughs> is discouraged from promoting OERs unless they're the ones on OE, on BNN's OER platform. It's like the wow. faculty the faculty okay. can do what they want. But like the library is not supposed to talk about OERs unless it's on their portal. Oh, that's so weird. Yeah, it's pretty skanky. Um, I might be able to find the uh, the piece of the contract that I'm not supposed to have if you... Uh, do you have a Barnes and Noble at your campus? Oh, yeah, we do. I have something like, I don't know, a 15-year contract. I think we're coming to the end of it in a year or two. But... Um, wow. Yeah, it, it's... And, and you know... Faculty, of course, knew not a darn thing about any of this, but um, give me like five minutes to listen with one ear where I search for the, the email with the language in it. Wow. Eric, have you found that, that um, or I'm sure you have found, I guess a better question is at what level or what rate have you found that um, students are, uh, this is sort of a gateway drug, I guess is what I'm asking, huh? that students are saying, oh, what is this, you know, what is this Jupiter? What is this R? What is it, you know, what, what's behind all this and, and getting into sort of the, uh, getting, uh, starting a personal journey with, with open source? Yeah, that's a great question. So I sort of had this question when I was like, oh, wait, you're teaching, you know, this is my, a little bit related to bits too, where I'm like, so if you had a class that was like, how to do reproducible science, you would be like, you need to know about Jupyter Notebooks and GitHub and Zenodo, you know, you would need to know some of these things. But they don't say that explicitly in data eight, they never mention explicitly that they're teaching them these tools of basically like reproducible science. So I, I had one semester that I taught a connector class and I brought the people from bits in and I brought some other people in. And I was like, look, all these things that you know are these like, 
first class things transforming science at research universities, amongst other things. Um, so, I, yeah, it, it's a little bit meta, you know, sometimes for the undergrads. Um, I did have one student in that class who was just like, everyone should be required to take this class. And then I was like, oh, you know, you just get that one student with the one. Yeah. All right. So um, I will not share this anywhere because it is actually part of the contract with the university's name. So not share it. it. So hey, Stephen, I, remember, remember we are recorded. recorded. Oh we're my recording. God, we're recording. Um, call me. Right now. Um, <laughs> These will be posted on the website, Stephen. Yeah, so I'm just going to okay. leave it that. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, there's the way it, it seems to work. And this is the same for anybody who has a Barnes and Noble, I would assume. So it's probably not just me, right? But one of the challenges in using OERs is this relationship where they, they want to be, you know, the hub for anything that's required or recommended, right? Um, and so that's a thing. That, that universities have to acknowledge. Um, hopefully this won't have me lose my job, but. Um... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's a funny thing back to Greg's question. Like there's, you know, when I started doing this a couple of years ago, there was like an age thing, you know, where it's like, let me just talk about stats where it's like for me and anybody older than me, it was like Stata, you know? And then there was the students that were like under 30 and they were like R, you know, but maybe the, the professor who's still teaching the econometrics class, let's say, was like, oh, it's always in Stata. The, ind you know, uh, the people in Sacramento hiring for jobs, they want people then, you know, like that, that was their framing. And then, you know, the students that are like the, um, the grad students and younger are all like R is the future in the in the same realm right um so it's kind of a point like so last year the econometrics class at uc berkeley like top econ departments taught in stata and this year it's like one semester r one semester python potentially like into the future that this will have been like an inflection year right and that is that just based on the the sort of uh, will of the, the the instructor? I mean, if they're saying, okay, now we're just going to do this in, in Python, or we're going to do in R, or whatever it may be, or or, or sort of how? I guess I'm asking, how does that how does that change occur? Yeah, well, I'd like to say like it's not my fault, but I'm like you know blowing on the balloon or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's totally up to the will of the instructor. I mean, the way the university is constructed, it's like completely up to the will of the instructor, you know, for better, for worse, 100% autonomy for you. It's very rare that a curriculum committee would tell you which software to use, right? Um, I think, you know, the instructors smell the winds of change and they sort of, they're in touch with their graduate students and they know what the grad students these days are using and they're hip to bits, you know, and they're hip to like, you know, journal practices, you know, they can smell it that it's happening. Um, and are you know, they then learning, like, are they then learning R or like, how, how, or are they sort of um, outsourcing that or, or what is, what does that look like? Great question. You know, so sometimes in, enough instruction is done by the grad students that it can be like the ambitious grad student that converts the class. And so the teacher you know, that's how it happened in a, in a key moment where it was like, the professor didn't have to redo all the materials. You know, the, the amazing grad student yeah. redid all the materials, but once they're there, then it's okay for the professor to like, you know, take those on and teach them. Um, so that's sort of where we're at is like, oh, once there's a corpus that then the next person can do. Um, you know, but it's all over the place. Like I, there was this one professor who would just, you know, super old school, hand people or send people a PDF that's like, this is the problem set, do this problem, right? Do it in Python or whatever. You know, whereas like what I'm trying to say with what we do is like make a starter, like, you know, make a curricular material that's like, yeah. you know, I'll read in the data set, I'll tell you what the variables are, I'll plant the problem. There's still coding for you to do, but I'm making like, you know, a little chapter assignment, you know, uh, 
and I'm getting you started and, and, and it looks rich and elegant. You know, it, it looks like a nice document. Um, so that professor, you know, was just like, I'm, you go do your homework, you know, uh, install it on your machine. Like it's not their problem. You know, I've totally had professors say that to me too. Like, oh, why do you need computational infrastructure? Installing our studio on your own computer is something that everyone should do, you know, which I, that's true, yeah. but you know, equity and inclusion and laptops and, you know, long tails and. Yeah, yeah that's oh. been an issue, especially in the open source course for me too, because in most places, open source courses are computing courses, right? And the thing I do is multidisciplinary and and we've we've had professors like, yeah, well, you know, you got to set up all your virtual machines, do this and do the other thing. And, and, and it's just agony for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. the, the professor who has to, to put the non-computing students through that, the, the students who already know how to do that and are bored, and the kids who are struggling to figure out this piece of computing that they haven't dealt with before, right? It's like nobody wins. Well, it's been yes. interesting too. And Eric, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the session and then hopped in to help record. Um, but uh, I, I also love how much that entrenches in like effortlessly the process of having those notebooks and those sorts of environments available. One of the interesting elements that we've been, and I also learned Stata, um, you know, 20 years ago as well. So I still got the scars from that one. But um, one of the interesting things that we've been, we've had a, a project where we've been working with, in many cases, uh, librarians and those at in uh, university IT and other research organizations to look at, you know, where there are risks and challenges for infrastructure with the pandemic and everything that that's brought and hearing from those that are um, at other sort of, you know, sister schools for the data science environments that are kind of bridging the data science and the library work, um, hearing some of the ways in which the budget constraints have led to outright saying like, no, you don't get this expensive piece of software just outright for everyone in your class because now everyone is virtual because we have like budget cuts and you can use our, and like, I know that it's not necessarily, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily at sort of that collective action inflection point of being the thing that gets people to move beyond some of it. But it has been fascinating to hear the, um, the, the sort of pressure that's in just in small cases and anecdotally by having that economic uh, volatility and the budget constraints of the, the past few months with the pandemic having that drive a very different engagement at certain institutions where there is that sort of capacity sitting across those departments to serve the sort of research data management library subsection um, to, to say like, no, there are open source tools that help you with qualitative analysis. There are open source tools that help you with quantitative analysis. You know, here are the easy ways to get up and running and we actually have this hosted here. And so it's uh, a... <laughs> It's funny though, the dual challenge of, and Stephen identified one of the, the prongs of it, right? So one challenge is, and we both actually, Stephen and Eric both identified them uh, separately. So, you know, Eric says the stasis, right? This is the way we've always done it. And it's working for us, maybe a little painful, but I know how to do it. So let's stick with the status quo. And Stephen's is there are commercial interests that, that are, you know, in ways that are, are uh, sometimes passive, often active, that are lobbying for, no, this is actually a better way to do it. You should use our environment or our resource or our, you know, technology, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, it's a, it's sort of a comprehensive and active choice to, to say we're going to do this, you know, as OER or an open source or whatever it may be. And it's, it's, um, uh, it's hard to sometimes to get people to make that active choice, I find. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I feel like there's a lot of this stuff that's been robust to teaching in the pandemic, you know, just taking like all of UC Berkeley online for two semesters. Um, I think having this data hub and this like, you know, ubiquitous compute in the browser tab is like, is first best. 
I haven't been like overselling that. There's lots of people that are just like, can't change anything, can't deal with the, you know, like people are just stressed out, you know? So it's not, I haven't been able to be like, you should all be using this thing. <laughs> um, but I believe it because of how, like I've seen how seamless it can be, you know, for just, you know, the assignments to just go there. Can I ask a question, and apologies if you already went over this, because um, I also know we've had a number of different individuals from the UC system and from yeah. the Python community. What sort of cost do you think is associated with like having the infrastructure that has made it so effortless and easy? Like, is this a, something that's scalable to other institutions? Um, or is it something that, you know, based on UC Berkeley's resources and the UC system, it makes it seem frictionless or more possible than other places? So there's two parts of that. One is cloud, this raw cloud cost, right? And this is like a long-term sustainability question. Like, suppose we're spending $10,000 a month on Google Cloud for cloud cost, right? It's way less than having computer labs. It's way less than having textbooks or Stata. Like, you know, given other metrics, it's still less. You know, I guess long-term sustainability, you're like, oh, do you pay a course fee if you are in, you know, data eight or econometrics or machine learning, you pay 10 or $50 a semester. You know, it's less than any, uh, you know, state of license, but it would st still be like the compute that you consume over the course of the semester. We're not there yet. And what's it, what's it going to take for that? You know, there are, if you take a biology class, you take an, an architecture class, take chem class, you can have a course fee. You can have a materials fee. You know, you can have like $200 biology course fee for materials. It's not impossible that, that that's, that's there. Um, we're not there with compute yet. Um, and then you get to the whole thing of like, should the campus build the compute or should we just do Google cloud? And there's lots of people on campus that will fight over that. Um, I guess there's the other thing of like, what about the IT guru expert who runs the, right? The person who knows yeah. Kubernetes and cloud and is an open source person. And, and those people are so amazing and they're what makes this all possible and they're irreplaceable and they're expensive. And, um, you know, so I don't, you know, that's one of those things where like, yes, I yeah. totally check my privilege that I'm at UC Berkeley and I have the person who writes the Jupyter Hub software as my, you know, sysadmin yeah. and, you know. Handy. Yeah. Handy. yeah. Well, no, and, and the reason the reason I ask is I think, um, I mean, Invest in Open Infrastructure was created to help shed light on some of that stuff. And I think yeah. that it's, um, it's always fascinating because what you just described as well about you know, the, the person who makes that all on the technical side support. I mean, in some cases it's one person to hold to, or two people or what have you. And so when you start talking about the complexities there, I find it really interesting. And I like that um, point that you made about how it's been normalized in other spaces to have a materials cost or to have, you know, certain other ways of supporting it. And um, not saying that it's necessarily something we want to add to an already expensive education for uh, individual students, but I do think that I'm always personally looking for creative ways that others have kind of looked at supporting some of these models um, yeah. to ensure that there is that sort of additional kind of catch, um, or at least additional sort of support. So. Yeah, I don't know if you, there was a lightning talk yesterday that was Chris Holdgraf, that's about 2i2c, and that's definitely the, you know, it's that's so the good. people I want to work with. That's what I see as the future. That's, yeah. you know, but they're only going to be able to support so much. Like, you know, we're doing a big push for community colleges. So we're working for two I2, with 2I2C to support data science at community colleges in California. But what are we going to do? 10 colleges with like 50 students each. You know, it's going to be an awesome pilot. That's my 2021. But, you know, the need is like yeah. bigger. Um, yeah, the question of how you sort of go from what in effect is proof of concept to scale, right, is, is yeah, it's a challenge for sure. But, you, you know, I, I, yeah. I think it's infrastructure. I think like the Cal, you know, CSU system should have this CSU wide. It's super scalable stuff, right? It's definitely does not need to be each community college or each CSU does it. Yeah, you they know, can share the infrastructure, right, for, for sure. 
and 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 combined that that's still you know sort of cal level right it's not right order of magnitude um yeah are you are either one of you finding that that this type of project is becoming sort of a um has some drawing power in other words are, are people sort of um uh coming to or or uh becoming aware of or talking about the the university or the program because of the things you're doing eric or because of the the open rit initiative Stephen. i mean is it is it is it bringing people through the turnstiles in some way so or it's too early to that? tell yeah um you know and there was an article part part of the things that helped me convince my university to do this was you know um first happens doing it first because it's always good if somebody else does it first uh, you know theirs is very different than ours but um b two articles that came out on opensource.com in the same month one of which continuing to, to assert that we were a leading open source education school and um the second showing how lots of universities are using open source to recruit and we haven't done a great job of using that program we have as a recruitment tool. Um, but my hope is, and you know, pandemic has gotten in the way of any making any moves there. But my hope is, is open at RIT will allow me to not only do what I've done for students on the faculty and staff side, but also give us more of an institutional momentum to take advantage of this for recruiting and other things, right? There's, there's a difference when you're just, you know, that one prof in the corner, right? With a couple of other profs yeah. who are like kind of piling on versus you're a center and office of the university, right? Then you can start moving things forward. So my hope is that a year or two down the road, we'll see a big push. But, you know, in some ways I'm do, I've been doing this stuff for 10 to 12 years and in other ways I'm just getting started. So yeah. it's kind of balancing those two sets of expectations and sets of experience. Well, I, I think both, both, are, both projects are sort of examples of um, uh, trying to embed this, you know, it's not just, it's not just this silo, right? That it, it's, 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 it's practices and philosophies and norms that, that propagate through the institution ultimately. Um, and, and I think that's, um, you know, it's overdue in a sense that we, I don't know that we, we have really, um, I don't know that we've done a great job of that historically in terms of open, um, you know, it often comes out of the library or an individual professor or a grad student is doing one thing. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is obviously much more ambitious than that. I'll be fascinated to see how it plays out. Well, I think the thing that leveled us up in terms of the administration's interest in doing this was, you know, the vice president of research has been very supportive of the stuff I've done over the years. And so he was the guy I went to and said, you know, if I wrote a white paper, would I, and he didn't let me finish the sentence. He said, yes, I will move it up through the food chain. And the provost came back with, has anybody ever held an institute wide meeting to gauge interest in this kind of stuff? And I said, I, I don't get to call institute wide meeting, <laughs> no. Um, and, and so Reiner Felly said, go ahead, call it, put my name on it. And I got, I had expected actually a large number of folks from like CS and engineering. I only got two or three people from each one, even though I know in, in the computing college, there's lots of people contributing. Sure, sure. But what I got was 50 RSVPs from 37 units across the campus. Wow. I got every college. I got the library. I got IT. I got, you know, you know, our, um, our computational linguistics faculty are in, are in liberal arts, right? You know, so people from places I had never even thought there would be any interest. And that's when they said, okay, maybe, maybe 
we really want to take a hard look at this. And, and the next thing they, they told me was, okay, make them do homework. See, see if they'll do more than just show yeah. up for a meeting. Right, and, showing up or signing your name to something. Those are, those are pretty low cost, right? Yeah, and, and the first meeting happened pre-COVID. And then everything else happened on Zoom. But we still had about 20 people who went to, in different configurations, went to a handful of different meetings online and built another 10-page document about things we would love to see this thing do. Yeah. And then the charter on the web page for Open RIT was kind of distilled down from that. And the provost said, okay, we will support this charter. Good luck. <laughs> let, let us know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, really. You've got two years. Try to get all this stuff done. And Eric, how about from, from your perspective in terms of engaging with other departments, is that um, sort of opportunistic or is it, it, you know, are folks sort of banging on the door to say, hey, how do we... How do we collaborate or, or what does it look like at, uh, at Cal? Yeah, so in, inside Cal, it's very opportunistic and weird and finding the right prof and finding the like-minded person. Turns out that the earthquake guys are using Python anyway. So they were like, oh, cool. You know, the biology people, I just found like a couple people. Um, very opportunistic within Berkeley. Um, I'm like totally into the social science. So trying to find the younger social science professor who's ready to go this direction. Uh, but on the other hand, we have the outside of Berkeley part. And basically there's a lot of people that are like, my Dean told me to set up a data science department. What do I do? You what know, um, and then in some sense, it's like, we're competing with Pearson more than, you know, anything else where it's like, oh, we have a free textbook that's really well thought out and up to date, you know? So we get a lot of people just coming for reasons like that. Um, Do you, you know? Oh, sorry, it, after you, after you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely people are are curious and leaning in. Like, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a, a Jupiter hub that's this big at another university, like this many concurrent users per day. Oh, I don't, I, I, not that I'm aware of, certainly.